Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those online. I guess you're some of the few like me that didn't travel this weekend, so uh, it makes it nice for us that are here, you know, a little less crowds. I noticed the roads were e easier. It's nice. So I want to say happy July 4th. It is the 247th birthday of our country. Isn't that amazing? So I just want to say God bless America. God continue to bless America. Uh, he's got his hands full with us, right? <laughs> it's okay. Um, anyway, I just thank you for coming in the heat uh, today. Just stay cool, be safe, stay hydrated, um, but also just enjoy this beautiful place. So our vision at PVUMC is a love that crosses all barriers and embraces all people. We really believe that because that's what Jesus showed us in his actions and we know that of our awesome God. And so we, too, live into that vision. So all are welcome is what that means. Everyone is welcome. So find someone later after the church that you don't know. Say hello. And let's truly live that vision of loving all people, no matter where they're from, no matter that, how they identify. We welcome all people here. We have uh, one announcement. The family camp is back. So we're announcing it now so you can save it on your calendar, September 1st through 3rd. Uh, this is all types of families, all ages. We're going to go up to Mingus Mountain. It's beautiful up there. Escape the heat, and it'll be a beautiful time. Uh, ben and Kristen will be leading that. So if you need help registering online or any questions, contact them. Also, if you need scholarship help, just let them know. We have some scholarships set aside, but hope you uh, put that down and uh, bring your families, all kinds of families. So as we move into worship today, I want to remind our online worshipers to please grab a snack and a drink for our communion, and Pastor Jonathan will bless your meal along with ours. And for all of you, we just want to remind you that there are instructions in your bulletin uh, that explain communion, and our ushers invite you to read those, so it'll make it a, a little smoother and easier for you as well. So, welcome. Welcome to the Lord's house, and I invite you to enter into worship. Good morning. Please stand as you're able and let us join our voices in the call to worship. How blessed we are that God forgives us and loves us for all those times when we have fallen short of what God would have us be. We have been forgiven. God makes us new in God's spirit. 
Now is the time to joyfully accept the newness of life which God offers to us. Come, let us worship and be thankful. Let us open our hearts to the peace and joy of God. Amen. is that time in the service when we practice communion. We do it with our children. We do it in front of our children. How did you learn to pray? By watching someone near and dear to you pray. Communion, we are invited to come to the table of our Lord. As we come into the presence of God, we are mindful that we have not kept our end of the deal, that, that we have not lived up to the ways in which God has created us. That's the power of a gift, <laughs> the gift of the presence of God. We, we become mindful that we didn't earn it. It's a gift. We become mindful of how we don't live up to it, the gift of the presence of our God. This is the 4th of July, or this is the 2nd of July, 4th of July weekend, when 
hopefully we will recall from fourth grade Mrs. Robinson's class having to memorize the introduction to the Declaration of Independence. Well, remember all those points, all those ideals, four score. So that's Gettysburg Address, boy. <laughs> See? All those ideals that the Declaration of Independence puts in front of us, and our minds go to all of the ways that we don't live up to those. Patriotism is a funny thing. We can soon find indifference to suffering, and we can wrap it in patriotism and wave a flag and call it good, but it is not good. Patriotism is living in that tension between the ideals upon which we were founded, the ideals we hold so high, all people are created equal. And also the awareness that we fall short. And yet it is a gift given to us all. As you come into the presence of God, be mindful of where you are between the ideals and how things really are. Our table, of course, we are United Methodist Church. We practice an open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. For those of you at home, you don't have to even be present. We believe the Spirit of God makes any table God's table. And all people are invited. We also believe that it doesn't matter if you've got uh, Hawaiian king's bread and Welch's grape juice. That's what we use or if you've got a Cheez-It and some Mountain Dew. <laughs> we don't care. It becomes the body and the blood of Christ, and it courses through our veins, and it changes us. I want to invite those who will be assisting with communion to come forward at this time, and. Uh, I, I want to change how we do things just a little bit. We're all just going to come up and get the bread and the cup, please, and get our hands clean. Brenda, would you hand everybody what they need? Here we go. Yes. Go on around. Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and once you have your bread and cup, go ahead and form your station. And we're going to invite everybody who's here to go ahead and, and move to the station that is closest to you. Form, form a line. This is the body and the blood of Christ. Jesus said, this is my body, and I give it for you. Eat this and remember me. Jesus said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many. Drink this and remember me.
Good morning. At this time, I invite all the kids to join me up front for a children's time. This is how communion should always end, with a hug to a friend, right? But you guys haven't seen each other for a while because you're on vacation, right? Yeah? So that's so fun when you get to come back. Do any of you have fun vacations planned soon? Yeah? What are you going to do for the 4th of July? Are you going to go see fireworks somewhere? You don't know? Maybe? Well, I have a picture of something on this piece of paper. And I'm going to see if you guys can try to guess what it is. So my first hint is that it's something living, and it's something that's kind of all over the place when you walk outside right now. <gasps> Not grass, close. You're close, it eats, it eats grass. What do you think? It's an insect. <gasps> Grasshopper, you're right, you got it. I, they eat all. They eat everything. We don't that you don't want them to eat. Like people who garden, they'll eat the one thing you don't want them to eat. You love grasshoppers. You're gonna try to catch one. Do, how do you think you can catch a grasshopper? Do you need a net? <gasps> you get startled when it hops. I do too. They they always hop when you least expect it. So if we look at my picture here of a grasshopper, there are some things that grasshoppers have that we have. What are some things that we share with grasshoppers? Legs, yeah, eyes, feet, a heart, yeah, a brain. They have a really cute little mouth, right, that eats everything we want. So right there, you see the little mouth in his eyes? How do they jump with their huge long legs? Right? Now, because we have legs and eyes and a mouth and hands and feet, are we grasshoppers? No? Are you sure? We're human, so we can share things. You're right, we don't have antenna. Plus, grasshoppers, that's right, that's a different kind of foot, we don't have that. And grasshoppers are pretty small, right? And are we small like a grasshopper? No. But sometimes, have you ever had somebody make you feel like you're too small to do something? Yeah, never? You don't think so? That's awesome. Has anyone ever told you you're too little to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. <laughs> it's different talking about size versus ability, right? So that's really fortunate. And that's something, William, you make a really good point, right? Because we know that we're always able, we're always able to do great big things. We don't have to be afraid of challenges, right? Because God loves us and God is always with us. So even if someone might try to make you feel like you're small and can't do something, you know that you can because of God. So let's pray together, friends, okay? Good morning, Jesus. Help us to remember that with you on our side, we can overcome the giants in our life. Amen. All right, and we can head off to Sunday school. We have a habit of giving at PBUMC. If you attend here regularly, we hope you make generosity one of your rituals of faith. If you're a visitor, we don't expect you to give, but we hope you're giving somewhere, as this is an act of faith and worship in caring for our world. Let me tell you one of the reasons Cindy and I pledge a portion of what God has blessed us with. As lifelong Methodists, I've, we've come to appreciate our connectional giving called apportionments. Apportion giving is a term which describes how the money you give to our church each week is divided and distributed throughout the United Methodist Church.
Through our support of apportioned giving, we are able to participate in the ministry and mission of the United Methodist Church, both locally and around the world. Apportionments are fuel for ministry. They enable us to share the concerns of many people. When we work together as God's children and combine our giving, we are able to see the word apportionment not as a constricting budget item, but as a means of bringing God's grace into our churches, our conference, and beyond. Here are just a few examples of where our apportionment giving goes. Our congregation's apportionments help pay the cost for our United Methodist colleges and universities, including Africa University in Zimbabwe, which provides a college education for over 1,200 students from 36 African countries. Our apportionments are paying for teachers, pastors, and missionaries around the world in Russia, Korea, and Africa, to name a few. The United Methodist Church is the only Protestant denomination allowed to maintain a permanent presence in Russia. Africa and Korea are the fastest growing Christian communities in the world, and the United Methodist Church has an active and visible presence in both of these locations. Our funds to the World Methodist Council have made it possible for Wesleyan churches to be established in 132 countries. When Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, FEMA realized that they were not prepared to deal with the ongoing process of providing disaster relief. They asked, for the first time in history, UMCOR to take over the operations in Alabama because the United Methodist Church was the only denomination with the structure and the resources to take on the task. When you give to your P to PVMC, your giving is divided into many pieces and travels to many different places. It generally goes to the support in three areas, our local church, the general and jurisdictional church funds, and the ministries of the Desert Southwest West Conference. That's missional giving. You can give when the ushers pass the plate around, or if you're worshiping with us online, you can go to pbumc.org slash give now. Thank you for your worship through your giving and your loving care for God's world. Oh, <laughs> 
Please stand for this morning's scripture reading. I'm reading selected passages from the book of Numbers. The Lord said to Moses, send some of your leaders to explore the land of Canaan. So they went up and explored the, the, the desert of Zin as far as Rehob. Upon returning, they cried as they tore their clothes, saying, this land does flow with milk and honey, but this nation devours its own inhabitants. Everyone, everyone we saw there was enormous and powerful giants. We were merely grasshoppers to them. We must not engage them in battle, for they were sh surely, we will surely be devoured. But Joshua, one of those who had explored the land, did not tear his clothes and said to the people, Do not allow fear to cause you to rebel against the way of the Lord, and do not fear the people who have devoured others, for they are no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed. Do not fear them. Thanks be to God for the gift of Scripture. Thanks be to God for the gift of Scripture. seated. Uh, I am Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we've, been, we've been working through so far this summer, we've been working on a, on a series of sermons on loyalty, where our loyalty belongs, what it means to be loyal, what it means to be disloyal, what it means to get distracted in our loyalties. And so, we're going to continue onward this week and next week, and we'll wrap up next week. This is a two-part sermon. We're going to do the first half today. I thought about trying to cram it all in, and then I thought better of it. And uh, so we're going to do the first half today. We'll get the second half of, of these, this sermon together. This, this is a huge scripture. We don't think of this as a huge scripture, but it is. It shows up. In the New Testament, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's all been done before. I'm going to tell you about that a little bit as we go on today. But, but here's where we're going to start. There is this thing that happens when people are in community with one another. Uh, it happened to Moses. It happened to Jesus. It, it's happening to Moses in our text today. What happens is that people become friends. And that becomes a bit of a problem because we might think that friendship allows us to say things to someone they don't want to hear. 
We might think that, but most commonly, most oftenly, friendship means that we don't say things that are rather glaring. We, 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 we're friends. We don't say unkind things to each other. We, we, we learn to ignore what's sometimes inappropriate. Um, it, it's a loyalty thing. It, it, to be friends has come to mean not saying challenging things to one another. Moses would go up on the mountain and God would speak to Moses. And then Moses would come down off the mountain and the people would refuse to hear what he said. They, they would say, tell us what we want to hear because we're friends. Jesus would come in from having prayed and he would bring the word of God and he would talk about it and people would say, aren't you the son of Joseph, the carpenter, and Mary? Uh, we're friends. How can you say that to us? In our text today, Moses is still the leader of the Israelites. They're about to cross over into the promised land. Word comes from God that Moses' time as the leader is about to end. The leadership must be passed to someone new if they're going to go into the promised land. And it comes that way. God says, if we don't change leaders, you will not be entering the promised land. And, and, and we might think about that for a minute and say, well, the, 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 the demands upon the community are going to be different. They probably need a different leader, someone who's gifted in a different way, different skill set. Yes, absolutely perfect, fine. New gifts, new future. Great, got it. But here's why the leadership needed to change. When you have a new leader, they can no longer be in on those agreements that get made between friends. They, they don't know that they're supposed to be quiet when a certain person acts in such a way because, well, we're friends. They, they don't know that there's a, an agreement in the group that we don't talk about difficult things. They don't know all of those. They're not in on those head nods, those winks, those agreements that have been made. People who have been together for a while develop loyalties to each other. That They agree to not talk about things that might need to be Address. They learn to speak only words that are familiar, complimentary, unchallenging. They overlook inconsistencies that get in the way of faithfulness because we're friends. And in that situation, the effectiveness of, of a leader diminishes. It absolutely infuriated the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, absolutely infuriated them that Jesus refused to honor their little club. We're in. We're with God. And he said, no, you're not. They had the winks and the nods and the handshakes. They had the political structure to pull it off in front of the people, and they did. And Jesus said, you don't know the God you say you represent. You spend no time with the God you represent. You spend your time spinning your message. Spend time with God and then be authentic to what your message is. And we might say it costs Jesus his life. This, this warning, this problem is a bit of a thematic message in the Old Testament. This is something that God seems to address repeatedly. Just a couple of examples. The entire book of Hosea is about this very problem. The, uh, Hosea was talking to the community that was focused on everybody being great friends. And Hosea's observation is, there's no one among you who can speak the truth. There's a, a significant current in the book of Malachi 
about the club of religious men and what they were doing to the women in the community. Basically trophy wifing, throwing out their old wife and getting a new one from foreigners in their midst. This is a, sub a substantial piece of the message of Habakkuk, the danger of thinking that treachery wrapped in handshakes and smiles will protect you when life falls apart. It's also a repetitive message, uh, and I say repetitive because it's, it's at that point. It happens that often. It comes up that often in the New Testament, and not just in the Gospels. It, it shows up in the early churches and what they're up against, the, the political structures of the communities where these churches are, are formed. Acts is full of this. First and Second Timothy, uh, the, the community almost destroys the ministry of Timothy, because he doesn't buy into their little clubs. Titus and Philippians, all of them. This is just a challenge to anyone engaged in ministry that puts God first. This danger that comes with familiarity, subverting the way of God, diminishing the way of God, setting it aside, because, well, we're friends. And then uh, what happens uh, again and again and again and again, I'm almost done, and again, is that when someone in the community who is in touch with God's way speaks God's way, they are rejected. And the people start to complain about them, to them. Uh, that complaint, uh, how, can, how can you say that? We're friends. Speak easy words to us. And if you go home today and you read the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, what you're going to notice is that God does not take kindly when that kind of complaining begins. God says, I have my message, and it is offered to you. Those who have ears should hear. And then God goes on and has a, a bit of a... Uh, this is after chapter 14 and before. God said, you asked to be rescued from the Egyptians. I rescued you. You didn't know where to go. I led you. I'm feeding you. And yet you are so quick to complain about things being different than they used to be. You had no future. I, I've given you a future I'm leading you in a new way. I'm teaching you to walk in my way, the, lead, the way that leads to life. And yet all you can do is complain about how inconvenienced you are. God does not like complaining. And, and you might think that the people in the tribes of Israel, you might think that since God speaks to them, they might have gotten the message and stopped their complaining, especially since God had to tell well, four, five, six, seven, I counted nine times in the book of Numbers alone where the people kept complaining. And you might also think that when we get to the New Testament, given the importance of the Exodus experience and the religious people took this seriously, so this scripture would have been familiar to them, you might expect that the religious people around Jesus might just recall that complaining about, well, we don't want to hear what God had to say. We want easy words. We don't want to notice that, that our ways and the ways that worked for us don't line up with God, that, that, that that kind of complaining doesn't fly with God. You might think that the religious people around Jesus would remember that and not do it to Jesus, but you would be wrong. What, what, what we might notice here is that this might just be a human thing. Because this is not just God's complaint against the people of Israel. This is also God's complaint against multiple nations around Israel. 
the wrapping of self-serving injustice and discrimination into a little club of men with a wink and a nod and a handshake and friendliness diverting power to their benefit. It's how oppression gets systematized and oppression gets God's attention. The Old Testament is very clear. This is the reason for the fall of the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom fell for different reasons, but this is the reason. The handshakes and the nods and the winks among a group of leaders who said, no, no, it's, it's fine, no, peace, peace, when there was no peace. It's the reason the northern kingdom fell. God says to Jeremiah, from the least to the greatest, they are greedy for gain. People claiming to be prophets, people saying they represent my way, wrapping themselves in robes of holiness to practice deceit. They plot together talking, and they have no shame. They turn and stand before the people and speak, and they don't even know how to blush. This is the thematic minister, the, the thematic message of Jesus' ministry. It's what he's up against. And it costs him his life. Jesus makes no bones. He, he says, beware of those who use the law on others. They like to walk around in flowing robes. They love to be greeted with respect and in the public places. They make a big show of their piety. They have a special voice they use for praying. They make a demonstration of making their offering. They take the most important seats. And yet they use the law to devour the houses of widows, leaving the widows destitute. You may be wondering, well, what does Jesus offer as an alternative? What, what, what should we do if, if our first loyalty isn't our friends? What, what, what should we do? There's, Jesus leads by example. There's this thing that Jesus kept doing. This, Moses did it too. Jesus had this habit of disappearing. One moment, he would be right there. And then the next moment, he'd be gone, and, and they would have to look around for him, and they, they would find him. They'd see him up on the side of the mountain, kind of behind a rock, or they'd see him over the edge down by where there would be a river if there was any rain, and he was behind a rock, and he was on his knees, and he was murmuring. And when he came out of of those places of prayer when Moses came down off the mountain, not only was simply being around Jesus healing, but he also had an incredible, unswerving focus, a, a profound clarity about his commitment to God's way first. Beware. Beware the trappings of familiar and nodding and winking and handshaking. Jesus calls it the road to destruction. He says it's wide and easy to walk. He says walk the narrow path. Be first in your commitment to God. One day, one of his disciples notices that Jesus is coming out of his prayer space. And this disciple is pretty bright. He seems to be figuring out that what Jesus does publicly is secondary to what he does in private. What he does publicly seems to flow out of what he does in private. And so he says to Jesus, teach us what you do 
when you go away from us. Teach us what you do when you pray, when nobody is around that keeps you so focused and it makes your presence so powerful and compelling. And Jesus says, well, all right. First, knock off trying to impress other people with your religiosity. When you do something for someone else, don't make it a performance. When you make your offering, don't make it a demonstration of your faith. We've all seen people who treat holiness as a recital, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. They get applause, yes, but that's all they get because God is not interested in performance. Jesus goes on, he said, the world is full of prayer warriors, people who control others by peddling formulas and techniques to get what you want from God, selling the wink and the nod and the handshake as holy. All of that performing. Jesus has a word for it. The word is nonsense. He says, you're wasting your time. And then Jesus moves. He says, he's been talking about being authentic in our practice of faith. And then he starts talking about prayer. He says, when you pray, find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to try to impress others. He says, praying in public is performance, and that's all it is. Real prayer happens in a quiet place, and it's just you and God, because you need to be saying things that you want no one else to hear. You need to be in a place where tears can run down your face, and you're not conscious of it, because you're in tune with God, and you're sharing your heart, and your hurt, and your concerns, and your joys with God. And what happens, Jesus says, is the focus shifts from you and what you bring to God and God's way. And when it shifts from you and what you bring, you stop worrying about, well, what can I do to solve this problem? And you let God take what needs to happen. You simply get pulled in and are reminded that you are God's property. And God does not let go. Jesus isn't done. He's about to tell us how to pray. But this is where we're going to stop for today. This conversation about authentic practices of our faith, being the real deal. Moses was the real deal. Jesus was the real deal. I think we can be the real deal.
please receive these words of benediction from Psalm 121, beautiful words about who our God is. Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord watches over you. The Lord will keep you from harm and watch over your life coming and going, both now and forever. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.